Thank you so much, Alexandra, for your introduction. And um, it's an immense pleasure to introduce this last panel of uh, today um, for the Art uh, Technology Panel. It's a very exciting moment in the world right now in terms of uh, experiments in art and technology. Uh, my late friend Billy Kluver uh, proclaimed in the 1960s EAT, the experiments in art and technology, and uh, we believe that today in the 21st century it's all about new experiments in art and technology. And that's what we're going to discuss uh, tonight. We, as every year, with Steffi and her team, and we think about how to bring art into DLD, think about, of course, about artist presentations, but we also think about involving a producer of new realities. So last year, we had Haney with Joe Haig, uh, and this year it is acute with uh, Daniel Birnbaum. As in the introduction mentioned, Daniel left uh, Moderna Museet, uh, an analog museum, to run a virtual museum. Uh, and it is very much about commissioning a completely new reality of many, many artists doing virtual and augmented reality. So for today, we thought about a very special format, uh, acute works with many artists from different generations. Daniel is going to talk about that later. Uh, from Jeff Koons or Marina Abramovic uh, to many younger artists. And there is a very new project which is just about to be realized with the artist Ku Shonga. So tonight you'll get a first insight in that process. And Ku uh, will in a minute introduce her film uh, animation which somehow precedes it will be now transformed into a VR piece. And of course, we spoke earlier today also in uh, several panels, particularly with Samuel Ross, but also with John Ruffman, also with Precious Okomoyon, about his idea of, you know, art for all, about the democratizing impu you know, impetus also with art and technology. There is a kind of an outreach, you know, far beyond the art world. And that is something which has always played a role in Kushonga's work, because very much uh, uh, going beyond the museum through skateboard parks all over the world. There is a skateboard park in Sao Paulo with Oscar Niemeyer. There is one actually in France, near an Aldo Rossi structure in Vassivier. Uh, and of course, with technology in a similar way, we go beyond the walls uh, of a museum and can carry these works in a way as John Ruffman described it very beautifully this afternoon, they can be everywhere, they can be an ubiquity of this work. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Ku Shonga. Thank you very much Good. for your invitation to Steffi and Daniel and Hans Ulrich to DLD. Um, I brought my uh, animation work I made 2017, um, arriving in uh, European countries uh, in the 90s. I was, I was doing uh, so many uh, spe site-specific installations and projects, uh, uh, small and big, and then um, doing uh, especially the skate park in south of France, uh, I, I got the kind of notion to how to work with in a team. So, um, so that project uh, introduced me to uh, making some film and doing a big uh, project, project like the film. Uh, I, I had a handful um, the, the notion to make an animation in an office with a, just one collaborator I, I met through internet. And then uh, so how um, I realized kind of two, three stories uh, um, at the moment into the animation. So, so one of these, um, the animation I produced 2017, you are going to see, there's one of the options, how um, elevated, elevated your mind. So three minutes silence, please enjoy, thanks.
Thank you so much to Kushong Ah, and it's kind of very exciting, I think, also that all of this work, uh, and of course also the VR piece, which is about to happen, still is very much connected to drawing. The other day, we spoke with Ian Cheng, with whom we worked at the Serpentine Galleries on Bob, you know, the virtual reality, the AI character, uh, basically, Ian invented. Uh, and Ian said it's just much, much faster to hand draw it than to sort of draw it on the computer. So it's exciting, you know, the drawing doesn't disappear. And if you want to see more of that, you can follow Kushonga on the Instagram account where every day uh, a drawing, also a daily practice of drawing, is published. It's now my immense pleasure to introduce Daniel Birnbaum. Uh, Daniel and I have spoken a lot about the future of the museum. We once wrote a text about it for Art Forum, have collaborated with uh, Museum in progress in Vienna, the museum, you know, basically using different uh, new media. And it was a very exciting announcement when we all heard a few months ago that Daniel would actually now basically lead with a cute a museum co commissioning VR and AR pieces. So it will be wonderful tonight to hear from Daniel about the future of the museum, about all these realized and unrealized projects of acute. So please give a very, very warm welcome to Daniel Birnbaum. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Daniel. So to begin with the beginning, I wanted to, uh, to ask you how this all came about, because it was, uh, I think, a really fascinating um, announcement, and we often discussed, of course, this idea of new experiments in art and technology, but in a way that you decided to really focus completely on the future. I wanted to see when you had this epiphany. Well, uh, it surprised me too, actually, a little bit. Uh, and. Um, um, it was an offer. Uh, it came out of, of work in the museum where I have been um, now for almost a decade, the Moderna Museum in Stockholm. You mentioned Billy Cleaver, who was a legendary person uh, many, many decades ago uh, when it comes to the, the dialogue between art and technology. Um, he started something called EAT together with Robert Rauschenberg and uh, the experiments in art and technology. And um, Billy worked for Moderna Museet. Uh, he was Swedish, he passed away some years ago. Um, and we have some of the key um, objects from that movement in our collection, and we often look into that, and that whole art and technology um, tradition is something that we look at, and we often ask ourselves, how would that, you know, how would that be phrased today if one wants to stay true to that? idea. It, it cannot just be nostalgia about the 1960s. There's nothing wrong with John Cage and Merce Cunningham and all those people, but what would it be today? Um, at the museum we had a number of conferences, and you see uh, a few images here. We presented three uh, artworks, some, um, yeah, it's now more than a year ago, with very, very well-known artists. Here's Olafur Eliasson. Uh, it was actually Marina Abramovic, Olafur Eliasson, and Jeff Koons. Uh, uh, very large names, of course, trying out this new medium, um, virtual reality. The works are still not quite done, done, but the prototypes were actually presented for the very first time uh, in Stockholm. I then thought I would use these connections to run the museum in a more interesting way, but then, peu à peu, you know, step by step, I was kind of... <laughs> brought into this dialogue, and at some point the people doing these works asked me, why don't you join us instead and, and, and concentrate on producing these works? It wasn't an epiphany, it was a continuous kind of excitement. But there was and also a moment in it which I remember, because we both always exchanged about, you know, Billy Kluver, and we at a certain moment started to think, you know, in London at the Southern Dam, we want to do new experiments, you know, in art and technology with Ian, now with Hitler Style. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you said we should actually also rework that history. And you started an exhibition project with Michel Kuo, right? About, about yes. the legacy. And I mean, in the sense of, you know, inventing the future with the past. It would be interesting to hear about that project. It is, a, it, it is actually maybe the last thing that I that will happen at this museum in Stockholm that I initiated, and it will happen in a year, or a little bit less than a year. And it has to do with this piece, Mud Muses, or Mud Muse, by Robert Rauschenberg, a very beautiful uh, art and technology piece. The show is not curated by me, but by someone we brought there called Lars Bang Larsen. And it's exactly that, uh, you know, what would EAT be today? 
It's not only about Robert Rauschenberg, it can be about Ian Cheng. We actually acquired this piece that you mentioned, Bob, a kind of algorithmic kind of experimental piece by, by Ian Cheng. So it will be from Robert Rauschenberg to Ian Cheng's Bob. So in a way from Bob to Bob, I said at some point. <laughs> um, and, and that will happen in a year. So it will be about you know, the classical works that had to do with that EAT movement in the 60s. And, uh, but it will also try to explore this dialogue today. And it's interesting also with Bob, I mean, when we show Bob at the Serpentine, it obviously keeps learning, it keeps evolving. Now it's going to start in New York in a completely new iteration. As Ian says, it's still in its infancy. That means these artworks are kind of alive and they evolve over a long time. And it's interesting, you mentioned these first projects. Here is the one with, you know, Jeff Koons. There's the one also with Marina Abramovic, the one with Olafur. It's not that they just are built, but the, the artists keep working on them. Can you talk a little bit about the process of working with these three artists we're seeing here and about these three different pieces? Because with Marina, of course, it involves, as often with her work, in a very direct way, the, the viewer, or however we call it, the, the user, uh, or the participant, maybe better, uh, because the participant can somehow either save her or not save her. Uh, but also in the other pieces, it's a very immersive experience, and I know that Jeff is still working on it, he told me. Can, of course. You, can you tell yeah, us about yeah, this yeah. process? I mean, uh, famously, Jeff takes a few years to get done with his works, but then in the end, they are done and often fantastic. Um, these are works that happened with this acute uh, studio before I started, but I was helpful since I know these people to kind of introduce them and um, so I was part of this dialogue from the very beginning and um, Marina was thinking what could I be interested in and it took her many weeks or months until she realized that she was primarily interested in her herself no um, joke by side you know that she's interested in her you know presence there her bodily presence and we know her work and so she has produced a kind of avatar of herself and uh, it's a piece about climate change and about you know, ecological disaster. And it's almost like a video game, actually, um, where you can participate and you save her. And if you s manage to save her, you save the planet and vice versa. It's, it's an interesting piece. Olafur is working with you know, perceptual phenomenological questions. So I think they're quite, they remain true to their, their work in, in you know, what they do in other disciplines. They are not maybe typical for, this, for these new mediums, but it's also been interesting to, to, to have those kind of artists working with these tools. We are, of course, going to work with much younger artists and artists for whom you know, the digital tools are you know, the most normal uh, uh, of things. And so it will be a transgenerational thing, this, this acute. And in that sense, maybe it is a museum. I was a little bit surprised when you said a digital museum, because it's more of a digital atelier so far. But um, maybe in the long run, it will be a collection and a museum too. I was just thinking, as I say, interesting about, you know, the Museum in Progress thing is interesting because in the 90s, you know, Joseph Ardner in, in Vienna with Katrin Mesner did this museum, you know, with TV, early digital, you know, with billboards. And maybe it isn't a museum today, but it is definitely an archive, right? And I mean, what's going to happen here with the, all these commissions, it's building up a very big archive of artists, AR and, and, and VR projects. What about Anish Kapoor? He yeah. told me that it's triggered a very unusual collaboration for him. He told me the other day that for the first time he collaborated with his son, who is an experimental yes. musician. Now we, we do this um, silent, you know, there, uh, but it's actually a, a, a music piece also. And it's his son who composed, who composed music. It's called Fall Into Yourself. It's a kind of journey through some sort of inner bodily cosmos. It's almost as if you really fall into your own kind of mouth or something and you travel through the body. And it's a kind of repetition, so it's maybe you're... You die and then you're reborn. It's a, it's a beautiful piece. He did it very quickly. And um, Anish has also talked a lot about it. I saw an interview with him in, I think it was in Financial Times, where he said that VR is dangerous. It's not easy. It's, uh, you know, it's, you have, it balances on this, between the sublime and kitsch all the time. We don't know if it's fantastic or if it's actually ridiculous. It's so easy to do something which is sensational, but when you look at it again, maybe you think this is actually just... Silly. Uh, and, and uh, you know, he knows this, and I think he managed very well. He's already thinking about a new piece. Um, he's also aware that, you know, technology 
moves so quickly that in two years we will think that these work look maybe a little bit 2017, you know, a little bit old already. But, you know, instead of improving and continuing to work on his piece, he said, that's done. Let's think about something new. Now, I think Anish is also another, you know, yet another person who we all know from, from the traditional art world. He's a major, major sculptor, but now he's trying these, uh, yeah, trying to experiment with these new tools. I think it's interesting. And of course, the idea of resistance is, is also interesting that uh, artists, you know, sometimes can give the medium a resistance, and certainly the biggest resistance so far came from, from Christo. And uh, <coughs> Stefan Arenberg is here, who of course uh, has just uh, published the amazing you know, book uh, on uh, the legacy and, and, and memory of the amazing you know, collection and, and collaborations of his, of his father, where you see these early collaborations you know, with Christo. And we did a more recent collaboration with Christo at the, at the Serpentine last, last summer. We invited Christo to, to London and uh, as always, you know, I would ask the question of the Unrealized Project and we stood on the bridge between the two Serpentines and Christo said, um, you know, he's got this Unrealized Project to build a Mastaba, one for the desert, that's still unrealized because it's gigantic. Uh, and then another one which would be 20 meters high, he wanted to build on Lake Michigan. Uh, here you see Marina, right? The thing yes. you described with the water. And, um, and so Christos said, you know, he really wanted to build this Mastaba and then a whole adventure started because we of course felt, you know, of course we want to build this and it was built, it was a big collaboration, it's difficult to build this, you know, uh, very analog reality and it evolved, you know, Westminster Council, our chairman Mike Bloomberg who did the gates with him in New York, the mayor of London, everybody got involved and, you know, we built this thing which was like a building floating on the lake uh, and uh, completely changing Kensington Gardens and making a really magical sort of thing also with the light and the mirroring. But actually paradoxically, the most difficult thing was to convince him to do it VR because we of course thought how interesting it would be that there would be a memory of this piece also, because the piece is, as always with Christo, it's the same with the Reichstag, these pieces are very limited in its lifespan. He wants them to go away after a few weeks or days and then be inscribed deeply in the memory. And it would be wonderful, you know, if there would be a VR memory to experience this piece in the future. And in a miraculous way, he got convinced, but there was resistance. There can be resistance from artists, you know, who feel skeptical about the medium. I mean, in a way, in this case, it will never go away because now it exists and it's an eternal piece and it's, uh, it's maybe no, not the most complex of pieces. It's actually, you know, in VR you can film things, you can film us here and it will be very convincing and, you know, maybe you will ha hardly know if it's real or virtual and we can, you know, represent things that actually happen in physical space. But we can also add things that are digitally generated and we can generate entirely, I mean, I'm telling people who already know a lot about this, I'm sure, but it can be mixed, you know, but in, 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 in um, Christo's case, it's really a documentation, one could say, but it's a very convincing one, it's produced with drones, uh, so it's simply filmed, um, but now it's online and, and it's actually on the Acute app. I didn't mention this, that, you know, we will install these things properly. Some of them are very heavy, you know, that you need a lot of technology and a lot of capacity and they're interactive and very complex. But we also do very kind of simple versions that are online all the time. Uh, so there is an app, uh, you know, you find it on App Store, Acute Art, and some of the pieces are there. And Christos, for instance, is, is there. And I know, I mean, I wasn't involved in this, but I, I heard that Christos was first very negative and as actually very kind of uh, hesitant and, and, you know, wondering why would he digitalize a piece. Now, of course, I mean, it's not necessarily only a great thing, but it, I, I'm sure it was a very well-attended show in London, but there's no doubt that it's going to be more well-attended online. Because it's yeah. already probably as many people have seen it online as, they, as people in the Hyde Park. And this will just continue. And this app is going to be downloaded between China and, and uh, African nations and Latin America. And, and that's, you know, what you talked about in the introduction. All of this is, on the one hand, uh, you know, art world specific and we work with some of the big artists, etc. But it's also, you know, about outreach and about democratization because it can be seen anywhere. Anyone who has a... Has, who's, who can go online, basically, and, and, and it's interesting. So Christo, 
I hope he has warmed up to the idea now. It exists. No, no, yeah. he has. And we, we, of course, you know, we're very excited because in a way, it will never replace the experience, you know, you had in the park and before on the panel, you know, with Carlo Ratti was discussed. It's all about offices, about, you know, what people can do together today, because otherwise I would not go to the office and could make it home any, at home anyhow. And of course, exhibitions are a lot about that. You know, the experience has a lot to do with people meeting at the Crystal Peace, and there were so many encounters, and this experience will never be, be replaced by, you know, the VR experience. But what is so interesting is when we installed the piece, one of the most extraordinary thing was that we had to go on this crane, you know, and I, I'm rather, you know, I have vertigo, so it's really a scary experience, high up on this crane with Christo, you know, installing the piece and looking at the piece. And then, of course, the viewer never had this experience because the crane was dismantled. And, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, um, you know, and ultimately you could, couldn't ap approach the piece anymore from above. And uh, at the same time, you know, you could see it from airplanes and, uh, and then all of a sudden in the VR, you can actually do exactly that. You can see it from all angles, you can approach it from above. It is in that sense a really great potential, I think also for documentation of exhibition in the future, which is another kind of archive. You mentioned the idea of working also with younger artists. Natalie Dioberg is an example of that. We saw it before, and uh, I think it's going to come back in your, in your presentation. Can you tell us a little bit what Natalie Dioberg did with, uh, with VR? Yeah, so she has done a kind of um, almost like a fairy tale. It's almost a little bit Brüder Grimm, you know, a little bit like a Grimm Märchen or something, it, it, with a wolf at the center. And it's a little bit frightening. I saw it for the first time some months ago, and you have the feeling that this wolf kind of follows you. Um, I, I think it's, um, you know, she works with animation, just like Ku Zhong Ah, and I think it's, it's an obvious move. And one can, I think, see that many, many artists have been anticipating these possibilities. I mean, not only people working with animation, even, you know, think about all the artists from the 60s and onwards who have looked into possibilities of immersion. I mean, think of James Turrell or, or you know, all the way up to our generation with, the, with Philippe Pareno, and, and, and I, I can see that they were almost doing virtual reality without having access to the medium. And, and you know, whether this will short circuit their ambitions or actually realize them is a question. But I can see that you know, often artists are anticipating possibilities that aren't quite there yet. I mean, someone said that um, Emily Bronte's novel Wuthering Heights was actually a film script although it was written before there was film, and people have said that Borges wrote, you know, hypertext, although he was writing in the 1930s. And, and I can see that many artists are kind of, you know, one can never prove this, it's just, a, you know, an, an intuition, but they're kind of, their artworks are longing for these mediums. They will, it will happen. And, and uh, you know, it's not only people working with digital tools or animation, it's actually artists who are working with, uh, with space. And Laurie Anderson is an exciting example of an artist who has experimented actually all by herself because she didn't really have initially, you know, uh, a cute or, you know, a big support to actually produce it all herself. She started to experiment early on as she always would, you know, with this interface, with technology. And uh, first time I went to see her, she showed me this VR piece where you actually take off on a plane and you see the seats and then all of a sudden, you're in the air and little by little the airplane is pretty scary, you know, starts to fall apart. And then you kind of sit on your seat high up there, you know, without the airplane floating and then lots of unexpected things start to happen. And she did this other piece where it has a lot to do with writing on the walls and, you know, that's the piece which is at Mars Mocha. There is the VR piece uh, to the moon, which is at the Louisiana, which you saw. Um, and then probably the most scary one is... Uh, the one with the heart surgeon, right? Because you're basically, uh, you know, in this piece and, you know, this is heart operation happens and all of a sudden you're there and, you know, you, you basically are exposed to this surgeon uh, and in the middle of the operation he says, you know, we are busy now and we just have to all quickly step out. And then you sort of hear the heart beating and, you know, the surgeons are gone. So they're very physical at the same time also these pieces of... Uh, uh, of um, of Laurie, can you tell us a little bit about her? She's on the board also. Of, yeah, I have of created a little uh, advisory board uh, where she's on, and um, 
for me, she's really a kind of almost a role model or a visionary, someone pointing in the right direction. And she has always been interested in new technological possibilities to an extent where she now says, I wonder what I was doing with this CD-ROM and, and, you know, that, you know, no one can look at it anymore. And, you know, but she's always been into new visual technological possibilities. And, um, if you're not a tech person, and I would say, I mean, the audience here, you are all, you know, maybe more at home with these things than I am, actually. I'm a kind of a traditional curatorial, you know, I've been working for the Venice Biennale and for classical museums, but I'm really into this from a kind of exper experimental and experiential point of view, um, that they actually offer possibilities, but they're o o often quite unappealing. I mean, wouldn't you agree that, you know, some of these headsets and all this kind of, oof, do you really want to be involved with that stuff? But, of course, once you're in it, you forget about that. And this is something that Laurie has really told me, that, you know, don't worry. You have to wear this horrible rucksack, you know, big kind of thing on your back, and, and, and you look at this weird stuff, and you have to wear gloves. And I went with her and looked at the thing in, 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 in Denmark at the Louisiana, and she presented another work at the Venice Film Festival, all very clumsy technologies, etc. But she said, in next year, you know, the that backpack will probably be this big and be in your pocket. And the glasses are going to look like, you know, Porsche designs, the ones that, that uh, Yoko Ono used to wear. It will all become a little bit more uh, attractive. But, you know, regardless of the unappealing, uh, 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 you know, nature of some of this stuff, she has always managed through her poetry and her beautiful voice to reconcile everything. No one cares, it's always Laurie. And Laurie Anderson's poetry can you know, take many forms, and it's often to do with the, yeah, with tech. And, 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 and I'm very happy that she's now helping us. <laughs> we, we will see how, but you know, maybe we will produce something with her, I hope so. But uh, even if not, she will be part of this uh, adventure. I find that very, very good. Yeah, and she certainly has done among the most successful v VR pieces so far. I mean, the other one is, of course, Inaritu's piece, which premiered at Prada, which is an extraordinary experience because, again, there it involves so many dimensions. It also involves, you know, in NASA collaboration, a helicopter which seems to approach, so there's the air. It, it involves you, actually, with your feet touching the sand of the floor, so all of a sudden it becomes a very embodied uh, experience. Of course, it would be interesting also to see what uh, a younger generation of artists who kind of grew up with these mediums, you know, are are going to do, and sort of a beginning of it we can see now with Sao Fei, the, uh, the Chinese artist, and I think one of the things which is also interesting in terms of the acute collaboration is that more and more we see now that artists actually want to make a VR piece or an AR piece part of an exhibition in a museum. So we are working with Sao Fei for a show for Autumn you know, at the Serpentine, and she, you know, as part of this exhibition, wants to do this VR, AR experiment, so I think that's another important dimension, you know, besides the idea of new productions, of archive, of acute, is this possibility of collaborating actually with museums and with exhibitions. And we, we appointed at the Serpentine two years ago, Jana Peel and I felt it's important that a museum has a chief technology officer. Uh, so then we thought like, wow, there's the John Latham idea that every museum, every institution, every corporation, every company should have an artist, you know, in residence. They should have an artist inside. So we say, you know, we cannot preach this all the time and not do it ourselves. So we invited with Ben Vickers, you know, a visionary artist, to not just be an artist in residence, but actually to become our chief technology officer. So we have an artist being the CTO of the Serpentine. And of course, we immediately began, you know, to commission digital works, digital commissions, as it be Evans, etc. But then Ben started to say, you know, that's kind of weird because one should really bring it into the shows. You know, it should not just be on the website, it should come into the physical space of the exhibition, which then happened with Ian um, and is now going to happen again with Hito Steyl uh, in spring and is, of course, uh, who was here last year at DLD, and is, of course, going to happen with Sao Fei. And with Sao Fei, it will be a collaboration with you. So that's a younger artist you work with. And then another, you know, artist with whom Ben Vickers is friends with and is obsessed by is Jakob Steensen. And it's interesting, that's another young artist you're working with. You did this great piece with him, Aquaphobia. So I just thought towards the end of this, you know, panel of this conversation, it would be great if you could talk a little bit about this collaboration with artists who kind of grew up with digital media and what you did with, with, with Jacob and what's going to happen with uh, Saufe. 
Yes, um, I mean, an important thing is that, you know, when you said at the beginning that I'm now leaving the museum world, uh, uh, that is true. I mean, I grew up in, 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 in just like you, actually, with, with classical uh, uh, art institutions and, and publishing. And, you know, in a way, it's uh, um, someone like Daniel Buren, the, the, the French artist, wrote these notes on the museum, notes on the studio, um, and uh, notes on the exhibition. And that's the kind of tri triangle within which most of us curatorial people have worked. You do exhibitions, you collect, you produce, and and uh, you know I've been um, lucky to be involved with a great art school in Frankfurt, the Städelschule, and and some of the big m exhibitions, and then a classical museum. So of course th it, this is a step into something a little bit you know terra incognita for me, a technological sphere outside. But it's immediately clear that we cannot only be outside. You know, in the future, maybe many of these artworks will happen in some sort of uh, virtual space that is nowhere, and you could all look at them at home via apps, etc. But, I mean, I'm a believer in communication and social kind of uh, interaction and intersubjectivity. Um, uh, you know, I think we will never get rid of the idea that we will launch things and have discussions and conversations like this and gatherings with, with an audience. So I think we always need to introduce these things also into, you know, places where we gather. Call them institutions or call them galleries or whatever. So I'm very thankful that we have this close dialogue with you. I think uh, with the Serpentine is uh, you know, ideal. It's one of the places that is not the big, clumsy museum. Um, I have nothing against them either, but you know, they're not going to be maybe the first one to, to go into this. But you are fast and you, are, you, know, you want those works that, you know, that mix realities. And, and you know, when, when uh, Acute is presented as a virtual reality, Site, it's you know I always feel Oof, that's not all. We want to be everything. We want to do you know augmented reality, mixed reality, holograms, things that we don't even know yet. And we will always be aware that they will also go into physical space. And I think those young artists who you mentioned, Ian Cheng and and Rachel Rossin and other people who we who we involve, uh, they grew up with these uh, technologies in a way that I didn't. Um, there for them it's so give such a you know given unproblematic, easy world, uh, but they're of course also interested in showing them and, uh, you know, things are getting, you can see there, this is actually already navigation without those ugly things. And the first exhibition, I think, in the world, I wasn't even there, was, uh, you know, an open event where you went at Acute at the Somerset House in London, where they already navigate interactive <coughs> VR pieces just with the hands. So it will be, you know, more and more, um, pleasant for all of us, and less and less clumsy, and, you know, exciting, I think. Last question, you know, we always have the unrealized project. Um, we talked about certain artists, you know, giving it resistance and not wanting to do VR. Is there anyone you haven't convinced yet you would like to convince to work with VR or AR? Any unrealized projects? Yeah. Should I say it? Yes, definitely. No, definitely Bruce <laughs> Nauman. Definitely. But I don't even know how to get at him. You know, I met him. I had sp like spaghetti with him a few times in Venice. <laughs> but he doesn't even answer the phone. So <laughs> maybe you can help me here. <laughs> Thank you so much. A big round of applause for Daniel Bianbaum. Thank you. Thank you so much. A big round of applause for Ku Shonga. And thank you all so much for being here. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.